Eric is second grade at Chalk Elementary and just want to know like him. Jack Pogue, I'm the library review specialist at Chalk Elementary and I try to provide as much as I can for my teachers so I'm here to see what they need. I'm Carmen Hatton, I'm the deaf education teacher for Chalk Mountain Public Park at Chalk Mountain Elementary and I went through the STEM program at Tinker which was really good. I'm Terry Gray, I'm Ashley Gibson Talented at Choctaw and County Park, and we're always interested in new ideas and things to expand for our children. Daniel Manning, um, Title I Reading Specialist at Choctaw Elementary, and I'm here to find out what I can learn. I'm Jill Sells, I teach at Jones High School, and I teach a couple of the math classes there, and I'm just looking to implement more technology in my classroom in a way to get it to reach our students. I'm Michael Roller. I teach eighth grade uh, for algebra and algebra at Jones Middle School. Same reason. Laura Bates. I teach math at Jones High School, and I need help with the technology also. I'm Carla Carmichael. I also teach math at the high school at Jones, but I also have the parent aspect. I have a 12-year-old son who is on the robotics team and really into STEM and wants to do more with STEM. So I want to know as much as I can to help not only my students but him as well. I'm Vanessa Perez, and um, I'm at Tomlinson Middle School in Lawton, and I teach computers middle school. And they're going iPad one-to-one -one this year. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Kathy Banish, as I said, and I have been fourth and sixth grade, um, self-contained elementary, stayed home for 13 years raising our kids, and then I went back last year, sixth grade literature, and this year I am middle school librarian. So I kind of run the gamut. Um, I'm really excited to have more opportunity to be pulling in different STEM things for our classroom teachers and hopefully get some folks that really want to collaborate with me. Um, I don't know if you all saw on your way in, did you all see the big green bus mm -hmm. that they're working on? That's going to be a <coughs> makerspace bus. For anyone that's in this area, check into that. That would be awesome to have roll up at your school. There's one like that in Austin. They talked about at iPad Palooza. That was a, the mobile maker space oh, that's awesome. that you could, oh, you know, just have come to your your uh, school or whatever. I think that'd be so a great uh, way to start. Yeah, Tulsa's Fab Lab has one that they're supposed to be rolling out this fall too. I know that the couple science museums, um, the Science Museum in Weatherford is the, help me, name for the astronaut. Stafford Museum. I'm pretty sure they have a mobile one, and then I think the Science Museum in Oklahoma City does as well, because they've come to my wife's school, Positive Tomorrows, before. It's not mobile, but the Oklahoma City Memorial Museum is opening up a STEM classroom. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. I got, I have the, they sent me an email, but, um, so if you are going to go do a field trip, you can also book the classroom before and after, and so there will be a lot of, like, interesting physics lessons with the, the collapse of the building and everything. I'll get that information. And uh, I'm periscoping this, so there may be some questions people might ask. Wait, yay. Um, but if you all don't follow Vanessa, she put together a great Google document yes. last spring of like every STEM science related professional development thing that she heard of, and she's heard of a lot. And so that was a great Google doc with some were paid, some were free. We, I mean, you've gotten to go to, to hear uh, Steve uh, Spangler, right? And he's come to the Science Museum a couple times to do his sick science yeah. and his chemistry stuff and all that awesome mixing chemicals. And like, she's the only person I've heard of that from. But it was for, it wasn't it for first year teachers? They initially opened it for first year teachers and then they're like, okay, now everybody. Okay, so they really, did open it. And they did it in the spring and the fall last year. Okay. So what I've put up on the board right now from my Twitter feed um, is Vanessa's blog and she blogged day one and two from our Camp Tech Terra and then there's a day three from Camp Tech Terra so um, this is and this was in Ada right this was in Ada at East Central University they brought in Susan Wells who came up with Camp Tech Terra she runs camps for children um, makerspace steam type um, activities and she kind of blew my head wide open about all kinds of new and fun ways to incorporate it and her thing is she likes to be outdoors she likes to hike and stuff 
So our second day, she had us, you'll love this, do digital storytelling from Wintersmith Park there in Ada. And we were to go out and find an angle to um, take pictures, video, audio, and then come back to the classroom after an hour out in the park and compile it all into some presentation to share so that we could then go back to our schools and show our teachers and our students this is how to incorporate the outdoor real world science with technology. And it was really interesting to see because we had administrators, we had early childhood, primary, intermediate, secondary, all different um, curricular areas, library media specialists, um, superintendent, you know, district people. It was interesting to see how each person put it together. There were ABC books, there were, you know, find the vowel, there was geometry. geometry. Um, How did you all share them after you We airplayed them. So you used airplay we, Well, we some of them some we emailed, emailed and some airplayed. <laughs> okay. So it was, um, it was fun, but it was. We used whatever um, app that we felt comfortable or a new one that we needed, wanted to learn more about. So like I used iMovie, she used iMovie. You use I use Book Creator. Mm -hmm. um, Lego Movie Maker mm -hmm. was another one. We Video. We Video. Um, what were some other ones that were shared? And some people mashed their apps together and made a presentation. So, what were the literacy skills that were learned and practiced in that? activity wow and what was the root did she give a rubric what were the boundaries of what you she did? really didn't give us a rubric because it was just you know get comfortable with something new was what she was hoping we would do yeah. um, some some new app or new presentation form mm -hmm. that you could then take back to school that you feel more comfortable with and that you had a final product okay um, to share story creator Lego movie maker you doodle Microsoft movie creator Beta, Shadow Puppet, Edu, Edu, uh huh, Book Creator, and iMovie is what we used. I thought the most interesting thing for me about that was that they were very uh, device ecumenical, like cross-platform. Agnostic. They were a device agnostic. agnostic. <laughs> ecumenical too. I like that. No, they were, they were. You know, so we had a combination of different devices. Like the majority of people were iPad, but if you had a Windows phone, there was no flinching. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, that was really neat. Welcoming to all brands. All devices. So how are STEM skills pulled into what you all did? And what, I mean, what are STEM skills? <laughs> For that particular one? Well, I don't know. Or just what, what did because when you say STEM, and this is a good thing to talk about is something like this, what, that means different things to different people. So what did, right. what did STEM seem to mean at EdTechTerra? And then Here what does it mean to... Here was classroom. This is where we kind of met together and they would showcase different things. Um, they shared the different, oh, hello, microphone. Um, they shared the different apps and how to use them and, and maybe some samples that kids had made at the Kids Camp Tech Terra. Um, so was there a Kids Camp going on at the same time? No, that this one but was? she had finished one in North Carolina and then flew to Oklahoma. It was her first time in Oklahoma. Um, flew to Oklahoma to do our professional development Camp Tech Terra and then was going back to do more kids. And Ma who organized this for Eastern, the ECU? Was it Mark? Mark, Mark Jones and Shelly Shelly Mark Shelly Jones. Shelly Shelly. So there's somebody else to follow, Mark Jones yes. on Twitter. He, and he's been there a year? He's been there a year. He came from He was at UCO. UCO and then he went to like Indiana for a little bit and he's back and he is awesome. And they're doing great educational mm -hmm. technology stuff there. And if you're interested in a master's, I'll do a little ECU plug. The Library Media Science Master's and the Ed Tech Masters are 100% online, and for in-state um, residents, it is less than $250 a credit hour. Wow. For 100% online. So okay. uh, Much better than any of the other 100% online. We, we had a meetup at ISTE, ISTE, the International Society of Technology and Education oh, 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 oh. in Philadelphia. Dun, 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 dun. And uh, we had an Oklahoma meetup of about 20 of us, and I got to sit next to Mark and hear a lot as far as what he's doing, and uh, it's great. It's really ex exciting. I'm trying to find some pictures. How much did this camp cost? Was this $149? For two days? Three, well, 
two full days. It was a half day, a full day, and a half day. And we were served meals and yeah. Yeah. Really snacks. Delicious. How many, and how many people participated? 37. 36. Oh, 37? 30, yeah, it's, they filled every seat. Okay. So, so what did STEM mean? What, I mean, does anybody want to, to what, what, do you, what do you think? Yeah. Like, and Christy, you know, jump in. Uh, you know, STEM generally is the science or either technology or tinkering, engineering, math. But I really felt like Susan said something at one point that really appealed to me. Um, that you know they had curriculum they had tons of curriculum they could have just like emailed it to us but they didn't do that because stem is doing you learn stem best by doing it but it's also what's your objective mm -hmm. her objective for the lessons may not have been your objectives at your school for your class for those kids mm -hmm. and so just handing over the lessons would not have been as beneficial as teaching us the behind the scenes whys because they showed us some amazing gadgets. Oh, some amazing I'm trying to find the pictures of all of them. I, I've got some. I periscoped what, it out. What I she did. said was, don't get stuck on trying to use it all, but find what works for your objectives. Because I went, and my brain was about to explode yeah, with too. so much information. But once she said, look at your objectives first, and then see what we have out here that would work for you. That kind of helped me narrow it down. This was a neat picture, I thought, um, that someone tweeted out from one of their presentations. It's not great resolution, and I'm not getting it to switch over. But it's the first step that she introduces her kids, and it's deconstruction. It flips the other way then. I, okay. it's, not, it's not playing nice. Okay. See? <laughs> oh, there. Did that? Nope. We're See? Just, it's okay. We'll just we can start. Sorry. Anyway, um, <laughs> she gets she gets broken electronics um, from thrift stores, and the first step that she does is cut the cord so that kids won't be tempted to plug it in the wall. And shock themselves. Uh, yeah. yeah. After, they've <laughs> after they've tinkered with it and then get a healthy dose of reality in the electrical sense. Um, her rules are, you know, cut off the cord first thing before they're in front of the kids, and then no glass. So the old TVs are not an option. Um, and then she just puts out screwdrivers and the micro tools so that they can take everything apart, all of the teeny tiny pieces and gears. Hmm. And her camps are for age 4 to 14, and the younger kids um, love to unscrew and de deconstruct. And then the older kids like to take those pieces after they're sorted and go over and construct with them. So I thought that was really interesting. There's, and she gets the little buckets and just sorts, you know, gears and screws and all of that. How many of you have heard of tinkering and the tinkering movement? Are you guys familiar with that? So that, that philosophy says, you know, and it's not just totally idyllic, but maybe more so in the old days, kids would work on their bikes, they would take apart radios. I mean, we would fix appliances. You wouldn't just throw things away, right? People yeah. worked on televisions and replaced the, the tubes in them and stuff like that. And so tinkering is a really good skill that a lot of things come from. And the, in San Francisco, I haven't been there, but there's there's the tinkering studio, I think. Oh, wow. If you'd like to do a great presentation, have a great free presentation, um, there's a conference called K-12 Online. It's k12onlineconference.org. Last year in the Maker STEM strand, the um, person who's in charge of the tinkering studio at San Francisco did the presentation. These are all videos that are around 20 minutes long. Anyway, tinkering is a movement and it's something that can be done with Maker Ed and with STEM. I'm really interested in that because that would be a center. I had five centers in my uh, second classroom the last two years and and that would have been a really neat one because what I mean again what do you think the skills are like what are kids what, what do you all see the skills of taking stuff of apart because when you tell that to somebody just like what why are you letting kids take stuff apart I mean why well, it's to find out the first of all to find out what's in there everyone's curious it, it piques their curiosity, so curiosity okay mm -hmm. uh, kind of the hook but then the mouse was yeah, the, yeah, the, the big catcher. The kids love to see in laptop, 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 laptop mouse. mouse. So it's just part of the, the it's not magic, it's technology, it is engineering it's and it's finding out component parts that And make she said up. then when they kind of have taken apart a few things, then they start to use those pieces in construction and they've seen what they were for and then they can start to imagine what they could be used mm -hmm. for to repurpose them. You know the little bitty speakers and mm -hmm. the mouse and how can you use that for another gadget or item 
So did she talk about having kids then create digital representations of what they learned or doing something with after after they took it apart we talked about it was it arduino boards Mm -hmm. arduino i haven't done much with arduino yet yeah Yeah, arduino boards and hooking them up to that and making them function from that um what else some of it was like the kits the the computer kits so that they would then recognize the components because they'd taken them apart from actual ones yeah they had the Kano, build your own computer. They were using Makey Makey. Um, Here's the Cubo. The Cubato. Cubato. There was a lot of like physical um, components to the programming. So, you know, it kind of appeals to the students. It's not just coding, coding, coding. coding. Yeah, it's not just on the computer. But I'm not to like go rogue here, but I would really like to hear more about what other people are doing too. I've been reading quite a bit about hackathons. Do we have anybody? I mean, it's, uh, well, there's, it's like a group project, from what I understand. I've just read a little bit about it, where you have a hacker who, who it's basically like you, you put a product together and then you have to market your product. So it's like a full-blown like entrepreneurial type thing. And so you have a hacker, a hustler, and then there's a, a third. And the hustler has to go out and sell people on it. And then there's a, there's a third job too that I can't quite remember the name of right now. They have all kinds of hackathon things on, um, going through Twitter, I've read over it several times, and it looks like a kind of an all-encompassing that could take all the aspects of STEAM and then build in the people skills that go with it and having to, so if you have a group of people, some people might have that abstract thought and they can put some things together while other people might have the people skills or the creativity to go out and have the interpersonal side of it. And so maybe there could be a lot of learning from each other. So I've been interested in in looking at the the hackers and the hackathon. So I have a story about that, that um, many companies now are finding youth via hackathons and and, and, uh, just identifying. We visited friends in Virginia uh, after ISTE who, and he goes to Thomas Jefferson High School in Virginia. They're, he's taking artificial intelligence classes. They have two at their high school. This is an incredible STEM academy. Um, but he was on a team with three friends as juniors. They had done a couple hackathons and they had learned some C++ and some Java. And MIT has a thing called um, bot, it's not bot ball. It's a, it's, it's a robotics competition where you design a, a virtual, a program that basically controls your uh, boss and attacks the other group. And anyway, they had 400 folks from around the world apply. They flew 16 teams to MIT, including their team. They were the only high school team to go. And they got eliminated in the first round because the guy who won has won for two years and he's a graduate student at Columbia. Oh and you know, but, but still they were there in the first round. But I did an interview with him and posted it to my blog. Um, because I just thought hackathons and then providing out of school opportunities for kids to not only develop skills, but then interface with others. And, and he said they were, you know, internships. There's lots of college kids that were there doing that. I mean, but do we have a hackathon in, in Oklahoma? You know, or do we know? In Oklahoma, like we have, we're very competitive in Odyssey of the Mind. We have, which, which is not an actual school organization, but we have six Odyssey of the Mind teams and four of them went to the world's. Uh, this year at Michigan State. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you're not familiar with Odyssey of the Mind, they give give a team of six or seven kids an idea or a a job to do. And it's the the kid's job with no adult help to find a solution and put things together. And so they have, um, and there's different types of uh, different types of rooms. There's like creator rooms and there's rooms where you just have to solve a problem. There are also uh, like drama everywhere. They, they have some different things. A like building that. one? There's a building. There, there's a building one. Yeah. Yeah. And the aspects of, of OM is how you interact with each other is just as much a part of the judging as your final product. So you actually have to get along with each other. Um, you can come up with the best thing in the world, but if you have one person who dominates or uh, there's a lot of infighting, you're not going to be scored very high. And so it teaches um, the ability to work with one another. And so I would think that there might be some similarities between like a hacker team and an OM team. There's interesting entrepreneurial groups going on. Uh, there's a conference called Social Media, Social Media Tulsa, 
that uh, is gonna, it, it happens I think in March or April. You know, there's different co-working groups in Oklahoma City where app developers and coders get together. Um, we have a WordPress meetup the last Monday of each month at Oklahoma Christian in Edmond, and we just had this past Monday. I think it'd be neat to have, a hackathon would be a bridge between those communities, right? And you could have, you know, kids participate and see, and so, does anybody, I mean, there's got, there's, surely there's got to be a hackathon. You, I didn't run one. I participated in one at uh, the Texas Library Association conference a couple years ago. And my only caveat with that was they put us in the groups and they we, we came up with our product, but I was the only one who knew how to code uh, in the whole group. Oh, so it was like... What did you code in? What was your... Um, even remember. Can we do a scratch? I, I would love to do that, but I would say that if you Put were to try and do one yeah. for, for kids, you need to give them the tools to actually yeah. program something if that's what your goal is. Like, I love the idea of just like throwing kids into, you know, the water, but if you only have like one person or if they don't have the actual ability to make it happen, then that's not. I don't think that's a good way to start. It's hmm. very frustrating. And we do have a coding club at our yeah. school. Yeah, so I mean, mm -hmm. and I love your idea of like they go in with their roles. Right. And I love the people skills aspect of that because that's what I hear from a lot of career tech people is like the kids that's like coming out of college and out of like career tech like just don't have any communication skills. So that's really cool. We should have one. We did a play date at John Rex Elementary downtown in Oklahoma City last April. And it was on coding in Minecraft, mm -hmm. and it was the if you not heard of Playdate, that's a model a little bit like EdCamp, but but you're you're basically just going to come and play with apps and tools. And so we had Minecraft set up in their lab on all their Minecraft EDU. Uh, kids were teaching adults how to play Minecraft and and what oh, to do. Yeah. Oh. And then we talked about Hopscotch, which by the way, my favorite coding app on the iPad is Hopscotch. Um, it's a little bit out of date now, but I published a book that's free on Amazon and on the Apple bookstore called Hopscotch Challenges, which talks about how to, to Hopscotch is a block-based coding program, similar to Scratch, that lets you, like Lego bricks, snap them together. And the two things I like introducing students to is how to make art with hopscotch, with code. So think of spirograph and how to make repeating polygons and things like that. And then how to make a collide game because there's an accelerometer in the iPad and you can tilt and very easily have a hero and a villain. And then you tilt your iPad to control your hero and then you decide what happens when they collide. Does the villain blow up? Do they shrink? Do they <laughs> you know, go, go away? And then you have a score. I mean, you, so that's fun. So I, I think it would be good to do something Along the I think before lines we do of, a, a hackathon in the state, we probably should do the play. Well, but there are kids with skills. Back to this point that Vanessa had, there's yeah. kids with skills. And I'd love to see bridging happen between Tech Center and be between amazing. regular forum. Texas are so good, aren't they? Isn't that just great yeah. for Tech Centers? But there's this wide gap between K-12 regular and then Tech Center. And it'd be great for kids to know about opportunities, for parents to know. Because I just know as the parent of three, like, I didn't know yeah, I, about a lot of what my kids could do in the tech center. So, I, anyway, kids who are taking coding classes at the tech center would be a great group to possibly, you know, invite or I don't know. So I found some of the pictures of the tech toys that they brought to share. Oh, good. And I'm just going to awesome. kind of flip through here. This is Osmo. Are you all familiar with Osmo? Um, it is it's really a mirror with apps. It's right? a mirror with apps, and it's fairly inexpensive in the whole world of tech. It is, my opinion here, it's more based towards uh, early childhood, primary, maybe pull it into intermediate, um, possibly some special needs with vocabulary and spelling. This is the Tangram app, and it shows um, the picture. I don't know which way I can make it bigger. It's all the same. Um, it'll show the picture, and then um, the spaces are black, and you physically move the tangram pieces around on a white piece of paper, and it will show in color on the iPad if you've selected the correct piece. So it's sort of bridging the technical with the real world. And, and there's several things that can help do that. Um, it, are you all familiar with Scratch? Scratch software. No. It's MIT's free software that's now web based, that's Lego brick based. And um, there are some versions 
There is actually an app now for the iPad that's full-blown Scratch. But the, the group at MIT that does that is called Lifelong Kindergarten. And part of their philosophy is that it's important to bridge the virtual and the physical worlds. They were doing things with Pico Crickets, and then they've worked with Lego We Do, which is an earlier, an easier version than, what's the complicated Lego robot? Mindstorms. Mindstorms. Have you ever done stuff with Mindstorms? There's so many parts and pieces. We did some after, we had an after school makers club the last two years. It was just hard to imagine doing that with regular classes. Yeah. So we did it with after school. But anyway, I, it, there's an important thing that happens in the brain when you have physical objects that are moving. My wife has been doing bee bots. I don't know if you've heard of bee bots before, but they're programmable bees and sort of like driving around forward, left, right. We use Sphero robotic balls. There's like 12 apps that come with the Sphero and they're about $100 each and we had four and the battery doesn't last all day. So we use two in the morning and two in the afternoon. But anyway, those things have a physical component. You're doing virtual things, but then you see this happen in the physical world. And, and I don't know all the words for that, but Mark would know that. There's, there's brain there's stuff going on, like in terms of having a right. physical manifestation, not well, the just... More, the more parts of the brain that you use, if you're, if you're moving and looking and listening, then you're more likely to remember it. Okay. So this is another part of the Osmo. It's the words and we were playing head to head so it's the red letters against the blue letters and it's like a hangman and they give you a visual prompt and then the yellow bubbles at the bottom are the correct letters and the letters up above the boy's head at the top of the screen are the incorrect as in hangman and the word was actually goggles and then each person is scored for their correct letters so it is a competitive game. So would you use that as a center in your classroom? Probably, and you can either use their pre-loaded words and visuals, or you can do your own. So this is where I was seeing it could come into more of an intermediate or middle school um, Why area. would you do that instead of just play regular hangman? Because you can pre-load the words okay. for the kids. You can do vocabulary so that you have the definition there and then they have to spell the word. Mm -hmm. You can do geography where they have to pick, you know, what state or country or river or whatever. Um, lots of different ways to pull that in. Um, what was this one? Why do I have a picture of that? I don't know. Uh, this was cool. Have you guys heard of Google Cardboard? Just watched a video about that last Google night. Cardboard is so neat. It You can make your own Google Cardboard goggles. They're like a view master. For virtual because, reality. Yeah, for virtual reality. And then you take your phone and put it in there and you can look all around as if you were right there. Very, very neat. For like 20 bucks, right? Yeah, you can bucks. buy them or you yeah. can make them and do it free. You can. If you um, make them, you still have to buy the NFC chip. Oh. And you have to buy the magnets and the washer. The harder part would be the NFC chip. Yeah. So that'd be the only reason that I would suggest buying, buying one. Might as well buy it. And, I've, and I've heard uh, my friend Eric Langhorst, who's in Liberty, Missouri, eighth grade U.S. history teacher, has done has a has a STEM class and um, he's tried the cardboard and just didn't think it lasted. It would last for the whole year. So on Amazon, and you can just go to the Google Cardboard website. There's different places to that they sell. Um, you know sets and and he recommended a, a plastic one um, that comes in green and red and, and black and white. And you can clean them because I noticed right. um, we used them after our hour in the park and there were little grease spots. That's where why all he of said our better than on the cardboard. It was really kind of cardboard gross. <laughs> plastic. Yeah, it's kind of like earbuds with kids. I'm interested. Does anyone have some projects that are like STEM but not? I need to go buy an iPad or I need to have a phone yeah. or like I need to go get a robot. Like I'd love to hear about some more like like challenge projects or something that's like this is just like actual cardboard or you know some chopsticks or some you know <laughs> some marshmallows or something. I'd love to hear about those. Um, I, I, mine is still you have to buy something but I actually I use the one that I use at my home. Um, and it's not, a, it's not tailored to a specific project but it really opens up like um, we're from Jones, and Jones is pretty, like, we don't have a lot of technology yet. We're slowly working on it and utilizing it in our classrooms, but, like, 
we uh, at the middle school level we had a lot of fundraisers and we got like a nice sized TV in our library for like presentations. Well, all the new TVs have USB ports on the side. There's a thing called a Chromecast, also made by Google. We keep hearing Google being thrown around. And a Chromecast can take anything that is on, as long as you have Wi-Fi, anything, anything on my phone, take anything on my laptop, take anything on a tablet, take anything on a computer, anything with Wi-Fi at all, and whatever is on there, put it on the screen. When we do our, we did our EOI like testing that. last year, and we just, to help the students feel a little bit more comfortable, we just plug the Chromecast in there. It has to also plug into the wall for electricity. And then you just Bluetooth connect the, or you Wi-Fi connect the two. And I literally scrolled through on my phone one of the big giant sample tests for the EOI to help the kids see that they actually knew these questions. And then, so, I mean, it could be as simple as that. It could be, I throw an app up there. Everybody's like, oh, I need you to see something. Here, check out my phone. And everybody has to like crowd around a phone. But if you have one television that has a USB port, you can mirror anything on your laptop, your tablet, your phone, whatever. And so if not every student has a cell phone, but if you make sure every student in your group, in their group has one right. cell phone, if they all worked on something and had one app that they all had access to, well, group one can present and they just hook to your Wi-Fi, hook to the Chromecast, boom, whatever's on their phone, whatever thing, like I've tried to use music apps in my class and I've done other things like that, but anything that you wanted to show, instead of having everybody do this, or you as a teacher, you could have everybody grade the presentation that's shown on there from their laptop, their phone, their tablet, their whatever. And that works with Apple products? Yeah, there's an app for a Chromecast for okay. Mac, and it depends on what you want to stream with it. You have to be on the same Wi-Fi, right. so it depends how your school has set up guests and all that. Because okay. in UConn, we had a separate guest for students which was not the same as faculty, which is what our computers were on. But as long as so, the Chromecast is set to that Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. and if it they, won't matter. And if they have it turned on, there's stuff. What is the cost stuff. of it? The, oh, a, 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 a Chromecast is like $35. Oh my and gosh. And it's, it's the one I use at my house. Like I'll just be like, I'm gonna watch Netflix. And I just grab my phone and I throw Netflix on. And then when we had to do it, I was like, oh, I don't want to write every problem on the, the whiteboard and I don't have a really good way of projecting it in the library. And I was like, wait, they have a new TV. And so I just brought my Chromecast from home. What's your Twitter? Do you have a Twitter handle? I do, but I don't do a lot. It's called, it's Math is Forever. I need, okay, I'm gonna probably ask So another cheaper, even cheaper way, which is similar, is Air Server. And I used that the last two years before I finally got an Apple TV. And it's like $15. You install it on your laptop or your desktop, and it has to be, again, on the same Wi-Fi as your phone. Um, and it's for, uh, app, well, I think maybe Reflector works on Android, too. But it, it basically turns your laptop into an Apple TV. And so you can then send your iPad or your phone to the screen. And if you, you know, you, you, that's plugged in and wired, but then you can wander around the room and. Right, but that, that's what I like about it is that as long as you're in the Wi-Fi, I can walk to other places in my house or in the school, and as long as I'm still connected, anything that I do on my cell phone or whatever is still seen. So because it's Wi-Fi, you don't have to be like, well, is the angle right? Is it lined up? Are the signals there? You can just be like, well, it's just through the Wi-Fi like anything else, and you can whatever you do. So like if you have a picture, you need to blow it up to show people, you just whoop, and then whatever you do here is mirrored up there. And it's... Some of the issues we have with that in Edmond is that we, our main Wi-Fi network has two networks. We have subnets built into that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's that, that we had to create, they created a separate subnet for us that allowed that to work. So they programmed those things in. So we connect on a separate thing, doesn't have to log in. So yeah. pre okay, so any of you all use AirPlay in your classroom? Do you have issue with it going out? Yes. Is, would, so would this be a great alternative for teachers? You, it really takes a lot of bandwidth to do that. And so okay. working with your IT, uh, Putnam City, I think, is one district that put Apple TVs in all their rooms. And it um, significantly affected everyone's internet connectivity. And so I think they had to then bump up their internet quite a bit. So if you're the only teacher doing it, that may be great. But if there's a lot of people that do, then the, it affects how much inside bandwidth okay. that you have. And it can drop, so especially would, if there's lots of collisions. It would be noticeable if a lot of people started hooking mm -hmm. them up in their rooms. It would yeah. be a... Sure, yeah, so you want to work with your IT to, yeah. And the thing that I like about it, though, is that uh, as a teacher, you end up buying lots and lots and lots of stuff for your classroom. This is something that is, for me, that I can also use in my classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, that's 
doesn't always seem to cross over a lot. Like you buy a yeah. bunch of like buckets and organization things for your classroom, and then you go, where am I storing this for the summer? Because I'm not going to touch this. This is not for me. Whereas the Chromecast is mine, and then I bring it to school when I need it. Very good. Um, Vanessa, the best non-tech project I did in STEM that my kids just loved was catapults. Um, and so we did catapults as our first hands-on project. Um, Amy Luffelholtz, who is the grade four or five STEM teacher at Lakeview Elementary in Yukon, had just, you know, I totally stole her whole thing. But we had a STEM, a STEM store with popsicle sticks, um, uh, you know, cups, uh, wooden, small wooden, um, you know, pieces of, of uh, yeah, like like blocks, but just small like particle board that, that I sawed up. Um, uh, trips of the hot glue gun, and so anyway, students built catapults. Um, well, we inter were introduced to catapults and talked about the physics of them. They built them, then we tested them. We had uh, contests for accuracy and for distance. We measured them. Um, they sub they they did submit the results on a Google form so that we could see who was the the you know who won. And then we did some averaging with the spreadsheet to find out our class average, you know, and, and so we did a little bit of technology with that. But um, that is on my website, stem.westfriar.com, if you want to tweet it out. And you can just uh, tap in the sidebar, Catapults. Um, and I love the, the STEM store. They had $1,000 to spend, and there were more things to buy than they had money for. And so as the group, they had to decide what they were going to buy and how they were going to use it, what their plan was, and then... Um, by, but they just love that. And so I really think um, that your point about STEM being you got to make it, you got to build it, and then it's integrated where we're doing math and we were talking about science and learning science and we were doing technology. It was a, it, that's a nice integrated unit that brought together multiple you know, STEM elements. Plus, who doesn't want to launch a catapult? The balls we made, by the way, I took a Kleenex and then wrapped duct tape around it, Excellent. and those were the balls. And then, then, of course, those disappeared mysteriously after every class, so they were easy to remanufacture, you know, <laughs> afterwards. And so, we did the Global Play Day. Have any of you heard of that? Uh -uh. Global Play oh, Day. The emphasis is it's totally child-led. Um, Adults are not allowed to interject ideas or thoughts or anything. It's kind of like OM, but it's just a play day. And our sixth grade collaboratively did this last year. Um, in my room, I had cardboard construction. And my husband is plumber and air conditioning guy, so I had some huge boxes. And the favorite one was the 40-gallon hot water heater box. And it started out as some place where they were hiding and thumping on them. And then as the hours went on during the day, there were arm holes and leg holes and they became this moving robot, not exactly high tech, but a very non-tech representation. Um, but what I loved about being able to have the cardboard construction in my room, one of my little guys that was a struggling reader, probably dyslexic, um, on an IEP, never felt like he was a successful learner. In 30 minutes, he constructed a house with a roof, a hinged door, I'm not kidding, 30 minutes, a hinged door with a latch, a male, male slot with a chute. And it was all lined up perfectly. And he became the go-to construction guy hey, how do I do this? Hey, I want to do this. What should I do? And he was just popping on these ideas. So it gave him a wonderful sense of accomplishment. He told me like a month later, that was my favorite day of school ever. Um, and to give him leadership in the classroom where he normally did not have a sense of leadership and confidence and ability, um, that to me was more important than any other objective I could have come up with. Um, just a sense of self-worth. That's awesome. With cardboard and packing tape. That's awesome. Yeah. Building with cardboard is great. Oh, and I had kids come back all day long. You know, duct tape's expensive, though, so you add that to your list and tell your parents you want <laughs> yeah. duct tape. Shopping. <laughs> you don't want well, I think that's actually, we're out of time. Yeah, we're getting pretty close. I did right. see that um, Superintendent Hoffmeister was mm -hmm. in um, the Twitter 101, the so we may be able to wave from a distance. Press the All right. So thank you, guys. Um, the lady from Tinker, can I talk to you? Sure. Okay.
thanks for periscoping us. Yeah, thanks for leaving us. Because I didn't get a chance to uh, tweet out a lot of the